Guess what, everybody? It's Friday. My friend Al Judd here just mentioned that uh, that it's kind of irrelevant for most musicians, right? So <laughs> Friday to most people, if you're not employed, doesn't really mean anything. But if you're at, at work right now, if you're one of the fortunate ones to be sitting in your office, streaming Facebook and getting paid to do nothing but hang out with us, then uh, I appreciate you being here. And if you're at home wishing you had a job, I appreciate you being here too. <laughs> so <laughs> there should be a song about that. There should be. They had a photograph of you. <laughs> so I don't need to do too much introduction because a lot of you guys already know who this guy is. Um, if you didn't see his name and picture on the post office wall, then you may have seen him <laughs> behind the uh, mixing console for a lot of the uh, touring shows that we've done the last several years. This guy and I spent some serious quality time all over the planet, on the beach in the Bahamas, in uh, uh, in, special in, in special catering at venues all over North America. I was thinking special clubs in uh, Fort Lauderdale, <laughs> you know, um, you know, secret certain secret society clubs and uh, everything in between. But right. um, uh, if you know him, you love him. If you don't know him, you're going to love him in a minute. This is my dear friend, Mr. Al Judd. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's good to see you, man. It's good to see you too. I appreciate you uh, cleaning up for the uh, the hang. <laughs> yeah, I showered today. It was that time of the month. Yeah, man. That's uh, uh, I'm sure your son appreciates that. Dad. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, snowing. he doesn't care. He it, doesn't care. Do you guys hang out in jammies all day long? Uh, pr pretty much until like later in the day, because we usually go for a little bike ride in the evening. So you know, we, we get dressed at some point and do a, go out in the world, you know, and go uh, patrol the neighborhood on our bikes for a little while. But I want, you what's, know. What's your, what part of the city are you in? You're in, you're in Los Angeles area, but I'm in Orange County. I'm okay. actually in a, in a very small little suburban town called Placentia. It's near Fullerton. I'm about 15 minutes north of Disneyland. Okay. So 15, 20 minutes north of Disneyland, basically. Do you guys hang at Disney when it's actually open? Um, we used to. When he was in preschool, I got us annual passes one year for Christmas. And um, so I would pick him up from preschool when I wasn't working or touring or whatever. And we would just go hang out for the afternoon. Like his favorite thing was to go hit up um, the, the um, Pirate's Lair, the island. Oh, yeah. You know? And so we'd just go run around and they, they closed the island at like five o'clock. So I'd pick him up from preschool. We'd get down there at like two. He'd just go nuts on the island for like three hours. Then we'd get some dinner and then we'd go ride like Haunted Mansion or Pirates of the Caribbean or something and come home. Does he like big rides? Like scary rides? Uh, yeah, he does now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you have a real true roller coaster partner? I, I think I will once we get going again. All right, yeah. man. Yeah. You saw that the guy in uh, Orlando at Disney World camped out for a little bit. There was a, a guy that just decided. I heard about that. Yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. So that may be several of us pretty soon, right? Right. So we'll have to hit up uh, Frankie and Eileen, see if they can get us in after <laughs> Maybe we'll go bomb uh, Pirate's Lair over here, you know? Yeah. There's lots of caves and stuff. You could probably hide out, hang out, hide out there for a few days and not get caught. You're not, you're not too far <laughs> then from uh, Knott's Berry Farm too, right? Right. So yeah, you guys, you have good roller coasters there. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. you know, Disney isn't quite the same thing for me unless it has a couple of loops, big drops, you know? Right. But, uh, I, uh, oh, but you've been to the Star Wars, the new Star Wars. Yeah, we world. did. Dude, tell me, I've not been. So tell me what, uh, like, what that's all about. It was pretty awesome. Like, I'm not a huge, huge Star Wars nut. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, I don't want to take away from the people because like there's some super Star Wars fans out there that are super into it. But I do have to say that um, we made it onto that Millennium Falcon ride twice. No. Really? And, and, and flying the Millennium Falcon with my son was pretty cool. I'll bet, man. Like that was... Did you, know, you get the a hookup? Hmm? Did you get a hookup to do twice? Because I've heard that's like an all day wait. No, it wasn't when we went. We went, on, uh, we went on some holiday last year. I forget if it was Veterans Day or it might have been Veterans Day. But, um, and it was really just a slow, it was like, a, like an astonishingly slow day. We just got really lucky. So it was like a 20-minute wait. So we went on it a couple times and did some other stuff. But it was, uh, it's, I mean, the experience of going there is pretty cool because you walk into it and it is like going onto a set of a Star Wars movie or something. You know, like they have you know, a couple X-Wing fighters and like the land speeders and all that kind of stuff sitting around. And there's guys in stormtroopers costumes walking around and, nice. you know, yeah. I've seen pictures of the stormtroopers up above. They look like snipers kind of like, yeah. And, and, and yeah. 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 That's they stuff. go up there and they have like this little skit that they do. Like they're mic'd up. So they're up there talking to, talking about the people in the audience. Like, Oh, watch out for that guy in the red shirt. Oh, you know? 
like dealing with hecklers, man. That's pretty yeah, good. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of a stand up routine. But yeah. If you weren't with Aiden, I'm sure you had some pretty, pretty good comebacks. But uh, oh man, yeah, that kid, that, that kid will keep you on your toes. Yeah. I don't know where he gets it from. Yeah, I don't know either, man. <laughs> you, uh, I'm glad to see you smiling, you know? Yeah. The, uh, yeah, you know? I, this is kind of a tricky time for people right now in our business, yeah. right? So. Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been a tricky time for me, but you know, I, I, like, I'm just taking it a day at a time, man. Like, that's really, it's Friday, just do Friday. Yeah. And that's it. Okay, so we're not going to future trip or really lament where you would have been, but right. you probably would have been working this weekend somewhere. Oh, yeah. What, oh, what, yeah. Was on, what was on the books for a Friday night tonight? I, pro- I mean, tonight I probably would have been mixing some band at, you know, one of the clubs around here. But, you know, I had a co- – actually, no, it's Friday, so I would have been at the Viper Room doing uh, Jonesy's Jukebox God. on KLOS. Is that a regular gig for you? It was. Okay. What's that? What? Uh, I've only been to the Viper once. Can you believe that? And saw Colin Hay. I've never played there, but uh, it's of course historic, iconic. Yeah. Sunset. Yep. But yep. Uh, what? Yep. So what's Jonesy's jukebox all about? Um, well, there's a radio station in LA called KLOS. Huge. And Steve Jones from uh, the Sex Pistols does a show from noon to two every day on uh, on KLOS. It's called Jonesy's Jukebox. And on Fridays, he was having special guests come in. Um, one that I was supposed to do, but got canceled was Ozzy Osbourne was supposed to come in, but he canceled at the last minute. At the and Viper? That, yeah, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Like he sits, like he, they have um, some contest winners come down and Wahoo's Fish Tacos would come down with tacos and burritos, whatever. And it was like a hang with whoever the, the person who he was interviewing was, you know? That's- that's bad. And we were just kind of getting that going because, you know, Kayla West got bought out by a different company last year, I guess. And okay. there was a studio at Kayla West that he used to do it at all the time that um, my good buddy Chuck I put in. And, um, and uh, I used to go down there and help him out with that sometimes as well. And, uh, and, the, and of course, Johnny K and Pierre from SIR did the sound system for that. Nice. You know, and I kind of helped him with the install and I teched it a few times with those guys. Um, but then when that went away, they were looking for a venue and, you know, we kind of figured, well, we should just, they should just find a club somewhere that's open during the day, you know, cause it's yeah. 12 to two and usually sound check kicks off at three o'clock. So it's a matter of somebody coming in and opening the venue a few hours early. Right. You know, and then doing the show and then just going into their regular day, you know, right. That's cool. Kind of double. So they worked out a deal with the Viper room to do that on Fridays, you know, for Jonesy to come in. But of course, you know, that went away, you know, with all this, that was like the first thing to go away for me. Like oh. we were supposed to go on, it's like the first Friday in March or something. Okay. And it was like, are we doing it? Are we not doing it? And then we got the call that Jonesy's not coming, you know, because yeah. of this, because of the COVID thing, like he's, he's not doing it. So we're, we're done. And I was like, okay, well, I guess we'll see what happens next week. And then as we all know, right. the dominoes started to fall, you know, yeah. Man. Another regular gig that I was doing was the breakfast with the Beatles at Casino Morongo one Sunday a month, again for KLOS. Okay. And of course, that's not happening now either, you know? Man, right. So, and you know, and I had like some different clubs around town that I'd mix at or little one-offs here, you know, fly dates, here, fly dates here, fly dates there, you know, of course, trying to set up a couple summer tours. Yeah. We've been talking about, you know, I had some tours lined up for the summer. I had some tours lined up in the fall and the winter, but you know theoretically there's still some things on the books right yeah but it's really weird like the music industry right now nobody really knows what's going to happen so there's a lot of things that are on hold that haven't been officially canceled that probably aren't going to happen like just talking to people my theory is that there's so many permits and licenses involved with doing live shows you know there's especially now well, there's the alcohol license, right. and your, you know, your occupancy permits and your fire permits. And there's all these different agencies that have to issue their permits for you to do a show anywhere. Right. And then insurance and insurance. Right. If any one of those entities says, no, you can't do the show, then the show's off. Right. Yeah. And that's it. So until everybody gets on the same page and says, okay, we're going to do that, then we can move forward. But right now, especially like in California, you know, people are being super cautious and I get it and I don't yeah. disagree with it. It's just right. a matter of, you know, at some point, you know, people are going to have to give the green light and then we can move forward. But, you know, especially in California, I really don't think that's going to start to happen until next year. You know, yeah. I think at least the big shows I think are done for, for 2020. Yeah. But, you know? 
And I, oh. I think, you know, I'm sure you're like me that you hope for the best, plan for the worst. You want to be smart. You want to be safe. And, yeah. uh, and you know, because as performers and people in the business behind the scenes, you know, it's, it's our bread and butter. It's our livelihood. But at the same time, too, everybody that goes to these shows becomes part of our family, right? Right. And so they, you know how bad they want to come see a live show, but you don't want to put them at risk either, you know? And, and with me, I can't help but hug them. Right. And I'm sweaty. So, so a big a sweaty hug is probably the worst way for uh, somebody to be socially distant. Right. So, yeah. Uh, oh, man, like Speaking of sweaty. Um, no, that, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, 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 uh, well, you know, I, we'll, we'll touch on a couple things because you and I, I let you in on my ritual. Right. Um, yeah. Back, back when I was uh, a teenager playing music and I was uh, super straight laced, but playing with bands. Everybody was older. Everybody was partying. And I always had a daily ritual or a nightly ritual. I was going to high school playing in the ski bars in Montana. And so I'd play those spin use until two o'clock, then drive back. And I'd hit the 7-Eleven on the way home to get an Otis Spunkmeyer cookie and a Nestle's Quick chocolate milk. Yep. I had to have my chocolate milk. And yep. so for most of my life playing music, that was my post gig ritual. Yep. My kiddo got older and he started playing music. And so we passed that ritual on. And I had a short bout in my life where I decided to switch from chocolate milk to something else, Patron or whatever, vodka. And, uh, and then I realized that was not good for me, not in a bunch of different ways. And I forgot how incredibly good for me and my mental well being is this beautifully refreshing drink right here <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we started this up a couple of years ago man when we we're on yeah. a tour and i told you about my thing so now we've got yeah. a we've got a like a, a gig ritual and so yeah. kids if you're out there and you're really looking for a way to party after a gig i'm telling you <laughs> you won't the chocolate milk nestle's are you listening to me <laughs> so, here's one for you buddy cheers heavy metal sponsored by <laughs> nestle's chocolate milk very oh my god phil buckman's <laughs> Give Phil Buckman a run for his money with your voiceover. That was good. He was the, uh, he had that, um, that sexy voice from Carl's Jr., right? With all right, the, right, everything. right. I think you've got the Nestle's deal down. So <laughs> we'll go 50 I used, to work, I used to work with a lot of those guys. I did television post production from like 96 to like 2002. And so I, I had the chance to record all the top VO guys. Like I worked with Don LaFontaine. Really? You know, yeah, when he was still around. Let's that, get like that, you know. In a world, that guy. Uh, you know? Yeah, awesome. And, uh, yeah, it, it was always a trip when he would come through because he had so many gigs happening every day. He eventually hired a driver just so he wouldn't have to bother with validating parking tickets because he figured out that if he was doing like eighteen or nineteen gigs a day, the time that it took him just to validate all those parking tickets, he could squeeze in another gig. Oh my! God. And that extra gig would pay for the driver so oh. it's like it's cheaper if i hire a driver and i don't have to deal with it and then he can make calls or whatever he wants when he's in the car yeah so he'll just hustle around to all these studios you know of course now most of the vo guys have a studio in their house right so they just dial up on the isdn get the script emailed to them and you know they can just sit there at home and, and knock it out but back then you know the guys used to actually come into the studio to do all that stuff you can really knock it out now because phil we did our conversation phil's got his vo studio Actually, his VO studio is kind of in the back, but most of his studio is right there in the bedroom. So yeah. he, can, he can knock it out both ways right there. Yeah, so like, right. <laughs> Sexy time. Sorry, Phil, if you're listening. Oh, yeah. That's all right. You're married. You have kids. They all know how it happens. But uh, I, uh, man, so, okay. So you would have been out doing some of these shows. You had a bunch of fly out dates. I know some of us would have been overlapping. You know, you and I yep. could have had this conversation yep. backstage at whatever, you know, and Catalina or, you know, in uh, Orlando at Disney World or whatever. But I'm kind of grateful for technology allowing us to, you know, mirror, you know, just sort of uh, connect this way. I, um, I think about some of the conversations we've had about these tour dates that you've had in the background. And one thing that I get goosebumps thinking about your Scott Weiland era, man. I, I don't know how much you can talk about with that. Are you? Is it well, we can talk about anything now. I mean, it's all it's all one of the bridge. And, and if we're going to talk about that, I got to give Doug Greon a shout out. If you okay. guys um, really want to hear a lot of Scott Weiland stories, Doug Greon early on in this thing uh, did a whole series of stories talking about tales working with Scott. And he was uh, Scott's partner in Soft Drive Records and at the Lavish Studio. 
and and Doug also wrote and produced uh, Scott solo records. Oh, okay. Happy and Galoshes and the Christmas record and a bunch of other projects. They did a bunch of projects together. You know, we were both around during the Velvet Revolver era. You know, there were wow. stories from that. Um, I bet. You know, and then you know we did a ton of tours with the with the solo band as well. You know, how, how did so, you connect with Scott? It was through Doug. I knew okay. Doug, and then um, I pretty much got the gig. You know, it's no secret that I've been sober for for quite some time. And and Cheers. and I uh, basically got the gig because I was a front of house. I could do the front of house stuff. I could do the tour managing stuff, and I was also sober. And it was and it was at a time when you know Scott was trying to to kind of try to stay sober. That lasted like three or four days into the tour, and then it was off to the races. But at least I could kind of mitigate the situation because I knew what I know the deal. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you throw somebody in there who's not used to working with addicts and alcoholics and doesn't understand how that goes, like good luck. Yeah, no kidding. You know what man. I mean? It's, so it's, at least I knew what we were dealing with and I could handle the logistics of like, you know, herding the cats and getting everybody to the gig, you know, and like the yeah. one feather in my cap that I'll give myself the entire time that I was with him is through all the quote unquote seizures and all the drama that happened on the road. We never missed a gig when I was with Scott. Really? We, Not we one. We played every single show for every tour that I was on. Wow. And that was no small feat. No, those weren't seizures. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's, there's an epic story on the plane, which I'll tell you if you, if you want to hear it. Oh, this is the Dallas trip. Yeah. The Dallas trip. All right. Let's hear Dallas it. Man. Okay. Yeah, people, so, people need to know this. Okay, so I forget the year. You can look it up on TMZ. It was all over TMZ. You know, it was, it was, it was a thing. But, and that's part of the story, too. But anyway, so we're going to Miami to do this one-off. Scott was doing this partnership with this fashion company called Eng English Laundry, and it was Miami Fashion Week. And so we're going to play at this dance club called Mansion, right? Big dance club in Miami. And I had advanced the tour and I asked the guys to like bring in a proper PA and everything. And they're like, Oh yeah, we'll have a, a real PA. Cause they just had like a dance club sound system in there. You know? Yeah. I was like, it's a rock band. We need, you know, proper PA. We need a monitor guy. Like we need, like I was advancing all of our stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of shaky. And the whole thing was like kind of being put together by this fashion company, which they don't understand concert production stuff. And they're trying to make it a fashion event. So already going into it, I was kind of like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're, we leave LAX, and this is one of the rare times where we were on the same plane together. A lot of times, Scott would have his own schedule. The band and I would fly earlier, like okay. flying the day before or whatever to get everything done, and then Scott would just basically come in for the gig and then leave, you know? You A lot of times he didn't why? come to sound check. Why is that? <laughs> it was just, just his thing. All know? right, yeah, like, yeah. He wasn't around for sound check, and like he was off doing his Scott thing, you yeah. know? Yeah, yeah. So I was with the band and the crew. But this one time, we were all on the same plane together. Scott was up in first class. The rest of us were in the back. And we're a couple hours into the flight to Miami, and this announcement comes over the airplane. You know, if there's any doctors on board, please hit your call button. We have a uh, medical situation. And I'm kind of thinking in the back of my mind, no, uh, no that's got to be something else, you know. And mm -hmm. the announcement happens a couple other times, and I'm sitting in my seat, and then all of a sudden, here comes Doug up the aisle. And I can just see the look on his face, and I'm like, here we go you yeah. know and doug tells me hey you know what it's it's scott they've got him laid out in the aisle in first class <laughs> like he's not he's not breathing they've got like the air thing on and they're like trying to you know trying to get him to wake up and he's not being responsive i'm like okay so i go up and i talk to the people and the pilot's like we have to land the plane like we, we can't let this guy you know like he's not going to make it we're landing the plane so they make the announcement, everybody put your seats upright. We have to make an emergency landing. You know, we go through all that stuff. I tell the band and the crew, you guys go to Miami, get cabs to the airport, keep your receipts, you know, or get cabs to the hotel, keep your receipts, all that kind of stuff. And I said, and don't go nuts. Like, be right. cool. Like, don't party. Hold it, hold it together for a little while, you know, because I got to, I'm, I'm leaving with Scott. I'm getting off the plane with Scott so I can go, you know, deal with this. You know, you guys go. You know, get a nice dinner, whatever, but don't go crazy. Like, you hold it together. They probably knew yeah. also, don't talk to the press, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. and that comes, well, that comes into play here in a minute. So, All right. plane, plane lands. Um, I go up to first class, 
And I tell him, listen, you know, I'm with this guy, you know, I'm, I'm his tour manager, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So the paramedics come on the plane and they give him some smelling salts and he kind of wakes up and the Notre Dame, he was a huge, huge Notre Dame game, Notre Dame fan. For those who don't know, massive Notre Dame fan. And there was a game on that was going to start. And he was like, no, let's just fly to Miami. I want to see the kickoff of the game. (laughs) We're like, dude, we just made an emergency landing of a commercial aircraft halfway to Miami, you know, for a medical, like you're going to the hospital. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, 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 I'm not going to the hospital. And the paramedics were like really professional. They were really nice. You know, they're like, well, you know, we really kind of have to. And he was trying to give them some, some, some clap back. And I finally just went, Scott, shut the fuck up and get on the goddamn stretcher. We're going to the fucking hospital and that's it. <laughs> and these paramedics are looking at me like, whoa, who's this? I'm like, I'm his tour manager. We're going to the hospital. End of discussion. Yeah. So, you know, they just get them on the thing and, and there was this one guy who kept coming up in the aisle who kept trying to take pictures, oh. you know? And I told him, like, hey, man, you got to sit down. You know, and he came up a second time. And I remember the flight attendant was like this little, I mean, sweetest guy, but he was like this short little gay guy from the South, you know? Oh, you know, and he was like, sir, I'm sorry. You're going to have to take a seat. You know, we're <laughs> having an emergency up here. But he was being really nice. And this guy kept coming. And I, and I, like, had to pipe off on him, too. I was like, man you go sit the fuck down or they're taking two people to the hospital today, <laughs> you know? Cause like at this point I'm like, I've had enough of like bullshit. Yeah. You know what I mean? right. like, this, we gotta, is, we gotta handle this. This is beyond you know? babysitter mode. Yeah. And there was also a press agent from, I don't know. I, I think it was like an independent press agent, but he was covering fashion week and he was like kind of interviewing Scott and managing all the fashion press for us and everything. And uh, so he was on the plane as well. And so we get in the ambulance. I'm in the front seat. The paramedics are in the back with Scott, you know, light siren. We're on our way to the hospital. And I get a text from someone. Hey, I just saw on TMZ that Scott had a seizure on the plane. What's going on? And immediately I know it's this press agent who was on the plane who wanted to get the scoop, you know, and he wanted to put it out that it was a seizure, you know, because he didn't want to have any drug stories or whatever, you know, but spoiler alert. Oh. You know, we get to the hospital and we found out that he'd basically taken a handful of somas and washed it down with a bottle of scotch. Oh, it wasn't an allergic reaction to peanuts on the plane. <laughs> oh. That would have been me. <laughs> yeah. Damn, man. But yeah, so so we get to the hospital and, uh, you know, and then of course management sees it on TV and they start oh. freaking out. So my phone's blowing up and I'm like, listen, everybody, the manager wanted to like get on a plane. Come, I'm coming, I'm getting on the next plane. I'm like, no, don't get on the next plane. By the time you get here, it's, you know, yeah. it's going to be squashed. Like, let's, let's try to de-escalate this, not, not build it up more, you yeah. know? So we get there, and um, a lot of stuff happens at the hospital. Like, I won't bore you guys with the details, but there's just, like, a lot of, a lot of drama. But the, the weird thing that happened is while we're there, at, it was after Scott had taken his blood test and everything because he wanted to leave. He wanted to go have a cigarette. I eventually got them to let me walk him out to have a cigarette. Like I went through the thing with the with the head guy at the at the ER. You know, he's like, "This is an ER. You can't smoke in here." I'm like, "I know, but there's got to be some place where I can take the guy out to have a cigarette." You know, just right. like let's just let the guy have a smoke. You know, and and uh, he was like, "Well, we have to take his blood samples first i'm like okay cool so he walks in he talks to them they get their blood they take their tests whatever like okay we'll send this to the lab he's like if you go out there walk down there where there's no windows he can have a cigarette and then you walk him back you know okay cool no problem so we go out we have a cigarette we come back and scott's really kind of agitated i'm trying to keep him calm i'm like talking to him about his kids and he's talking about his kids video game and then he gets a text from somebody and he gets you know all uh, all agitated understandably predictably right right the guy's just like practically od'd and been taken off of off a plane in the middle of his trip you know what i mean like he was not in a happy place yeah right and um and so they've done the test and we're there and by this time it's it's getting to be nighttime and all of a sudden the power in the hospital goes out Ugh. there's a power hit oh, God. and the emergency lights don't come on like it's pitch black right you're in the hallway smoking at this point? No, no, no. We're, oh. we're already back. We're in the oh, emergency okay. room of the hospital. Like, we'd okay. already been out for the cigarette. We're back in the emergency room. We're hanging out. Okay. You know, just, like, kind of chilling. Got the TV on, whatever, you know. And all of a sudden, the power goes out. And everybody in the, in, the, in, the, in the ER starts 
freaking starts freaking out like what's going on there's no lights it's pitch black i have a flashlight in my backpack so i pull out my flashlight and i'm shining my flashlight and there was a guy who was like on a respirator or something like a room over and they're in there giving him chest compressions and they've got like the hand pump thing so i'm holding the flashlight and these guys are working on these on this guy and like maybe a minute later the emergency lights kick on and then they bring in like some kind of emergency power thing and they hook this guy up to that but everybody's just like scrambling, you know, yeah. and Scott's like, I want to get the fuck out of here. What's going on with this hospital? This place is bullshit. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you need to chill right now. Like yeah. there's other people that have bigger problems than you. Yeah. Just chill out for a minute and we'll figure this out, you know? Yeah. So the light, the power eventually comes back on, you know, we chill out for a minute. I go, I talk to the doctor and when the power hit happened, the power supplies on their computers in the lab had all gotten smoked out. So they were going to have to replace the power supplies in the computer before they could run any lab tests. And so I go to the guy, I'm like, listen, just let us AMA out of here. Just, you know, we got, I had gotten us some hotels at the Hilton at the, at the airport Hilton at the DFW airport. I said, listen, let me just get this guy back to the hotel room so he can get some sleep, you know, and, yeah. and let us get out of your hair. It's like, well, we can't do that. You know, he's blah, blah. I'm like, I get it. But do you want us to sit here and be a problem for you? Right. Or do you want us out of your hair? You know, go talk to the guy, you know, he's just going to go back to the hotel room and go to sleep. Cause by this time he's conscious, like he's not, you know, right. he's, 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 he's back with us again. You know what I right. mean? Like, yeah, he was, you know, he was not in good shape, but you know, at least he was conscious and he wasn't dying. And you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at the guy. I'm like, dude, he's going to go back to the hotel. He's going to go to sleep and, and that's going to be it. You know? So I call the hotel and I have him empty the wet bar. I'm like, take all oh. the booze. I go take all the booze out of the wet bar, empty it, just take everything out and leave like a half a case of water in there, you know? Yeah. And, and so they did, they emptied all the, all the alcohol out of the wet bar. They left some snacks and some water in there and, and that was it. And I walked into his room and I like kept, <laughs> I kept his stuff. Yeah. You know, just keep so his phone like, too. You know, just so he couldn't like go, I want to get out of here and go, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and run off, which I didn't think he would because he was exhausted. I yeah. mean, he was beat, you know. So, um, so you know, he signs the AMA paper. I get a taxi to, 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 to take us over there. And Scott, man, I, you got to love the guy. He looks at me and goes, well, where's our SUV? And I go, well, Scott, here's the deal. <laughs> I can call the car service and they can have an SUV here in about 90 minutes or we can get in this cat, this taxi and we can go to the hotel. It's about a 10 minute ride. Right. So you want to get a 10 minute cab ride now, or do you want to take a 10 minute ride in the SUV in an hour and a half? He's like, let's just go in the cab. Yeah. Okay. The voice of reason comes around again. Oh so, yeah. So, <laughs> so we, it's your choice, man. You know, whatever you want to do Yeah. I'll stay here for another hour and a half. If you want, God. <laughs> you know, this sounds so, like, Every time I talk to you, this is that voice of reason. All right. All right. All right. So you get your cab. So we get the cab, we get to the hotel, I get him checked in and his assistant is also with us. And so me and the assistant like go, okay, he's put to bed. Let's go have some dinner. You know, like the band's, the band's uh, taking us to a, to a nice dinner tonight. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we went to the hotel restaurant and I remember I ordered the lamb because I got a call from the front desk. Cause I said, if he orders any room service, call me before, you know, to approve it before he gets anything. Okay. Because I didn't want him to try to order a bottle or, you know, anything like that. It was like, yeah, um, you know, the, the guy in room so-and-so and sweet, whatever it was, you know, was ordered lamb dinner, you know. <laughs> I said, any drinks? They said, no, just water. I said, send it up. And I was just cracking up because I'm like, well, at least he has good taste. Right. You know, absolutely. On the menu. <laughs> God. So, so the next day we have flights out at like noon. So we get together. And mind, it's like we didn't have any luggage. Like we didn't have toothbrushes. We didn't have clothes. We're still like, we've just been, you know, in the same clothes and everything for a couple of days at this point. So we just get on the plane and we go straight. I send Scott straight to the hotel to get some sleep and him and his assistant go off. I went straight to the venue because we're having sound check. So I just walk into sound check, like after all this stuff, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, guys, you know, like, let's just, let's tighten it up and, and, and let's go. And I walk in and like the PA isn't there. Oh, there's no, no. they have, they have a front of house console. That's like tied into the dance system, which is just like speakers around where the dance floor is. And like the monitors aren't right and all this stuff. So I go to the production guy. I'm like, dude, like we, we went over all this. Yeah. You know, I was like, well, it's kind of late to bring in a PA now. I'm like, yeah, but you got to have some monitors. You know, 
Yeah. We need, we need in ears for Scott. We need wedges for these guys. You know, we got to have it. We had a monitor engineer with us, you know, and I was but, like, but no monitors to use. Yeah. 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 I was like, I was like, call whoever you got to call, but you better get that shit here like directly, you know, without yeah. delay. Right. Because we're going to get this done and then I'm going to go get a shower before I have to come back here and do this gig, you know? And, um, so they pull all that stuff together, band sound checks, and then they were kind of jamming a little bit. And I just muted the front of the house call. I'm like, guys, I'm good. I'm, I'm going to the hotel. I love yeah. you guys, but I got I'm out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'll see you guys over there. So, you know, I go, and so I'm on my way out to go to the, uh, to the hotel and I see the press guy and the press guy is, is talking to some other guy. And this other guy, this like camera guy or whatever is like, Oh, well, you know, when we do the red carpet interview, we'll have the car pull up here and then he'll pull up here. And I talked to this guy, I said, all the interviews are canceled. Yeah. He's going to show up. He's going to do the gig. He's going to leave. That's it. Yeah. He can stop on the red carpet to get a, get a couple pictures, but I'm not going to have a bunch of press people asking him, Oh, what happened? What you right. see? What ha blah, blah, blah. We're not getting into all that. And that's the exact thing that they're all going to want to talk about. We're not right. doing it. Right. You know? And so he's trying to set up this interview and I look at him and I go, dude, there's no interview. Like, what are you doing? We had this conversation and the camera guy goes, well, if there's no interview, there's no press, you know? And yeah. so this, this publicist guy go, come here, let me talk to you for a minute. I go, man, let me explain to you the last like 24 hours that I've had with this. I go, if you were going to try to fuck up this program and put Scott on the spot and like sabotage him with an interview, I go, I'm going to fuck you up. Yeah. <laughs> they will God. find you knocked out in the dumpster behind this venue. I'm not bullshitting with you. You know? I'm sorry, like, man. I've, I've had it. <laughs> like, you know me. I'm usually a really I, reasonable guy. Right? I know. And so I'm trying to figure out like how many people that don't know you are thinking, this dude is absolutely fucking insane. <laughs> <laughs> and he is in a really good way. But all right. So anyway. But, but you know, like well, part of my job there is to like protect my guys. Yeah, of course. You know man. what I mean? Yeah. So if if my job is to look after Scott and you're gonna try to fuck with Scott, then I'm gonna fuck with you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's sorry, but I'm not just gonna sit in the corner and go, Oh yeah, sorry, Scott, they have to do the interview. No, you're done. Yeah. Right. You know, especially if you're trying to go behind my back after we've already had this conversation. Right. It's not gonna happen. You know what I mean? Yep. So he got the message. We canceled the interview. We did a little, you know, a little uh, step and repeat photo op walking in. He did the thing. And I talked to the car guy. I'm like, you don't go pull around the front when we leave. You go pull around this back door. As soon as we're done, I'm going to run him out the back door. I'm going to put him in the SUV. You take him straight to the hotel. Right. I told his, and like, his assistant and the management and I all talked about that. And we're like, yeah, that's the plan. You know, as soon as we're done, I'm muting the console. I'm running back. I'm getting Scott. We're, we're, we're walking right out this back side door, putting him in the car, and that's it. You so know? you're, you're TM on the gig and front of house. Yeah. And, okay, cool. Yeah. And all technically, right. I guess you could say production manager, too, because right? I was in charge of all the production advance and all that stuff, too. So Get three paychecks? Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's a quarter. Here's a quarter. Here's a quarter. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> all right. Okay. So... <laughs> Sorry, man. I didn't mean to bring that part up. But, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's real. It's all, it's all part of the gig, you know. Yeah, it's all yeah. part of the gig. So, um, show came off without a hitch. Yeah, man. I mean, the show was good. You know, he showed up and he did his thing, and the band was was on point as always. You know, and then we went to leave the next day, and of course, everybody. It's Miami. Yeah. You know, and wow. there's certain cities in the country where if you're on tour with the band, there's going to be a party. Oh yeah. Miami is one of those cities. Absolutely. So we go to try to leave the next day. You know, Scott's assistant had taken care of his travel arrangements. They were off. They were gone. They were doing their thing. You know, I think, I think they actually left like early in the morning or something. They were, they were gone. But I had to get the band and crew thing together. And uh, a couple of the guys were just MIA. Like they'd been out partying all night and we couldn't find it. And we had to leave for the airport. So like I went in their room. I packed all their stuff and some luggage. I left it at the front desk. And I was like... We got to go, man. Like, I'm not canceling everybody's flights. I'm going right. home. Like, I'm out. Yeah. You know? Th this is a one-off. You weren't, like, due for a next date the no, next day. No, okay. it no. Was, it was a one-off thing, and it was, right. it was just pissing rain. It was oh. just like, like one of those, you know, Florida monsoon hurricane just. Right. 
And uh, I'm like, man, I've, I'm over this trip, dude. We're going to the airport. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to re rebook flights or whatever. You know, yeah. they'll figure it out. Call yeah. me, call me when you, but as we're getting in the car, these two guys come walking up, you know, and I'm like, get your stuff. You know, we're, we're getting in the car. I'm like, oh, we got to take a shower. Or we got to take a nap yeah. and this. I'm like, no, you got to get in the car. We're going to the airport. Yeah. You know, you can sleep on the plane. You bet. You know, and so like we, we, <laughs> we had our asses kicked. <laughs> like all of us are just showing up to the airport. Oh, just like a mess. Feet, you know, oh. like, like barely make it through security, barely get on the plane. And we finally are sitting there just like, oh my God. Yeah. So we get home and, you know, and I remember just kind of like sitting there for a couple of days going, what just happened? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. That's what just actually it's like a twilight zone episode man yeah well you know i think you and i both live this sort of weird david lynch life you know that he <laughs> he scripted out half of the chapters in our book you know and i uh I, it, do you still stay in touch with the guys in the band at all i stay in touch with a few of them yeah uh, yeah um yeah, i would bet you could I, t- I i talked to probably tommy black and t- and doug the most you know okay. unfortunately jeremy passed away a uh-huh. couple years ago the guitar player he passed away actually on the night that they were supposed to do their uh, record release party really yeah yeah they uh they um it was time for sound check and he didn't show up so they sent somebody over to his apartment and uh and that Uh, was that wow so they they didn't make the show and you know they had to find a new a new guitar player and i think they had a new drummer and peanut allergy and and that was that was after i had stopped working with him though that was a a peanut allergy again yeah oh god oh man you know those uh the stories can you imagine trying to do this if you weren't sober you know just like i think about all the times you talked about herding cats it's comedic now when i think about how many times you've had to pull shit together backstage with me even right you even working, <laughs> but but you know it's not like i was a mess but it, mentally you know i was spinning i remember coming to you in vancouver going hey dude i'm struggling with some something right now i'm, I'm having a hard time getting my mind right on the gig and uh, i remember <laughs> You pulled me aside and, you know, just <laughs> get, kind of bitch slap me verbally a little bit. It was just the right amount to be able to go out there and have an amazing show. Right. And, and I love you and I appreciate it. I, I think about all the time. So you, you've had to take the reins and just wrestle people together, man. I, where does that come from? Where do, where do you get this, like this, uh, I don't know. I think this, um, I think about the, the storm analogy, right? I mean, the, the chaos right. is going, the tornadoes flying around. And it's not like you're subdued necessarily, but you've got that sense of reason that you're just like, all right, here's what needs to happen. This, this, and this, you do that, you do that. You're really good at delegating. And uh, I, I think, I mean, is that just years of practice or were you naturally always this guy that was- No, 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 I'm definitely not naturally this guy. All right. Like, a lot of that actually comes from, from sobriety, like okay. learning how to live life on life's terms, yeah. quote unquote, you know? Yeah. Um, and a lot of that comes from uh, taking personal inventory, like especially in the moment, like taking a step back, you know, yeah. taking a pause and going, okay. And, and, and in my mind, when, when chaos is going around like that, the visual picture that I have, like what I visualize is a hurricane, mm. right? Yeah. But if you look at the middle of the hurricane, the middle of the hurricane is, is like the calmest place to be. Right. Right. So if you can be the eye of the storm, and you just try to be cool and let all this chaos come around you and then figure out, okay, what's my objective here? What do I need to get done? Cause it's easy to get caught up and I, and I'm, and I'm a hundred percent guilty of it. Sure. It's easy to get caught up in the emotion and to get angry or frustrated or whatever. Done it a million times. I try not to, Yeah. you know, I try well, to like always be cool and, and just go, okay, we need to deal with a, B and C, but sometimes you try to deal with a, B and C and ABC is not getting dealt with. Right. Oh so, yeah. So you got to do something, you know, you either go, okay, you know what, this isn't my problem and I'm going to step away or you go, no, this needs to get handled and I need to do something. Yeah, man. You know, like uh, another, another example, I'm kind of looking at some of the comments here and and, uh, Josh Thompson, what's up, Josh? (laughs) Nice. Our mutual brother from another mother. (laughs) He goes, ask Al to ask Al to tell you about, you don't want this problem. Oh, that sounds perfect. All right. Yeah. So, so yeah, and this is, and, it, and it's funny because this is when I was working with Above and Beyond. It was the first day of our um, We Are All We Need tour. Okay. And uh, the electronic DJ tour and it started off in Nashville. And so we land in Nashville and, you know, with the, we have a lighting crew, the, the video crew, you know, there's like 12 or 15 of us or something in the, in the, in the party. 
and um, we have a van from the hotel that's picking us up. And this guy, this like random guy who's also staying at a hotel, just like hops in the van and with his luggage and he's sitting in there, you know, and their tour manager, Seamus, love Seamus, dude. Like this guy, I don't even know what to say about Seamus, but anyway. Um, so, so Seamus is like, yeah, right. You're going to have to, you know, they're all British. He's like, yeah, right. You're going to have to, you know, we've, we've got this van, you know, you're going to have to get off because uh, with you, there's not enough room for all of us. You know, I called in and I reserved. And this guy like started giving Seamus a hard time. And now, now Seamus is no slouch. Like Seamus is, has yelled at me about stuff. Like we've like gotten into it. You okay. know, he's like from Newcastle. He's like a proper hardcore, like, yeah. Blue you know, color. Take no, yeah. Blue yeah. color, take yeah. no crap, you know, but he's got a heart of gold. Yeah. You know, I love the guy, you yeah. know, even though I haven't talked to him for a long time, like I've got nothing but massive, massive respect for Seamus. So, um, and it's important that, you know, that everybody understand that because, you know. Okay. Anyway. Um, so, yeah. So, we're in this van and this guy's like giving him a hard time. And we're all like, okay, our luggage is loaded. We're all trying to get in the van, you know. And finally, I'm like, listen, man, you got to get the fuck out of this van, you know. And he was like, what? You can't talk to me like that. I'm like, I can't talk to you like that. Get the fuck out. And he, come, and he gets out of the van and he starts trying to yell at me. And I go, listen you don't want this problem right now. <laughs> I'm not something you want to have to deal with. What you oh. want to do is you want to shut your fucking mouth. You want to turn around and you want to walk away. Oh my God. Can you imagine ladies and gentlemen having <laughs> Al, Al as your dad? <laughs> it's not, don't make me come back there. It's, you don't want this problem. <laughs> okay. All right. So he kind of looks at me and you know, I'm with like 12 people. You know what I mean? Yeah. He kind of looks at me and he kind of looks at them and he's like fuming mad, but he eventually just, just shuts his mouth and walks away, you know? Yeah. So he goes away and uh, actually Jono from above and beyond, we were in the van. He was like, you know, I'm thinking about that. What you said, you don't want this problem. It's like, it's such a mind twist. Like <laughs> you're sitting there and you're listening to this guy like, wait, maybe he has a point. Maybe I don't want this problem. <laughs> right. These I don't are know. Not these are it's not the like, droids you're looking for. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. These are not the droids you're looking for. It's like a Jedi mind trick. It is. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and, and so he, he dicks off. And so we get to the hotel, but here's the funny part. So we're all waiting in line to check in and this guy catches the next shuttle bus. to the oh. hotel. Oh. So he's in line behind oh. us waiting for all of us to check into yeah. our rooms. Cringing. Cringing. And he's like, he's losing his mind, you know, and, and yeah. <laughs> and i'm just like dude sorry but you know it's you know like we tried we, we tried to ask you nicely like 20 times yeah you know and had eventually he, it's you know had he been cool you would have probably let him cut in line to not wait behind y'all but yeah, totally yeah so oh yeah i remember you from yeah. the airport you know right yeah blah, 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 but you know what i mean honestly that you know that kind of kindness goes a long way you know there are so many times when we're out traveling and we've got an entourage, right? There's a lot of stuff that has to happen to get a band checked in. And, you know, if people are douchey, you know, then, yeah, then it's worthy of leaving them behind. But, but it's nice to be able to sort of extend gratitude and kindness to somebody if you, you know, you don't want them sticking around for an hour if they're nice people, right? So, Dude, my thing is I try to be kind to everybody. I try to yeah. get along with everybody. I want an easy day. Yeah, you know, absolutely. 99% of the shows that I do when I'm settling at the end of the night, when I'm talking to the people, they're like, God, you guys were so easy to work with. I wish everybody was like this. I'm like, well, we do this every single day. So yeah. every single day I can either be stressed out and angry and frustrated, or I can go, ah, I know what we have to do. You know, we load in, you know load in do our thing do our show sell yeah. some merch meet some people get on our bus and go on our way you know yeah. it should be fun like it's, you it like, should be you should have fun doing this it should be like oh god i can't ah oh, this sucks oh this is horrible no it yeah. should be you know you should be yeah. having a good time doing it you know if you're not like none of us are getting rich spoiler right. alert wait know? what yeah, <laughs> that's why I'm looking for my Nestle's Quick Chocolate Milk sponsorship here. Right, but, uh, right. You know, uh, Nate Morton mentioned the other day, and, and I love this man. He uh, he mentioned this perspective changer for him that he was doing the share gig in Vegas at Caesar's Palace years ago, and he was meeting up with his buddy and said, "Hey, man, I'm, I'm sorry to do this, but but I got to go down and do sound check." And his buddy said, "No, you 
get to mm-hmm. go down and do sound check. And having that perspective, exactly, so good because exactly. all of us, when we're out on tour, especially like Lost Cities Live, right? I mean, we're out there with what anywhere from eight to fifteen bands on this gig, and each band has anywhere from three to six, seven members, right? And all the other peripheral sort of people that are along with it. And there are some people that have a really, really hard time being grateful for where they're at. Most of the people on these in this sort of package really appreciate the fact that, man, we are blessed to still be yeah. doing what we're doing, right? We're getting yeah. out, we're hanging with our buddies, we're playing these great shows, and and we get to go do that. And I uh, I just I almost infuriate a couple of those people that really have kind of a curmudgeon vibe going on, and I'll say like. Come here, man. Give me a hug. You know yeah, you right, love being right, here. Right, right, and right. I, I know it just pisses them off, you know, but um, but I love it. You know, I can do that with with you too. You know, we can kind of uh we can tease these guys into uh submission a little bit. Yeah. If yeah. if they won't come along with me and give me a hug, then I can just stick out on them and he can say, <laughs> You don't want this problem. Exactly. I want that tattooed somewhere. Exactly. I think you sh- you should have a tattooed in your forehead. <laughs> right, exactly. I can see you coming, you know. Man, you uh I, I, you've learned, you know, uh, the things that are happening right now in the, well, I guess globally, it's not the business. I mean, you've had to sort of shift anyway. I mean, when, when times, well, your career has really ha- been dealing with the ebb and flow, right? I mean, you're in the music business, right? So there's yeah. Easter famine and you've worn a couple of other hats, right? I mean, I know that you, you got uh, involved in real estate as well, right? So, I was, you know, the real estate thing didn't really turn out for me you know, that great. I gave it a shot, but I'm not, you know, it's, it's not really in my makeup to be a real estate salesperson guy. You know, it, I'm, it's hard for me to imagine you doing that guy walking into a show home and saying, listen, something's going on with the fridge. You do not want that problem. Okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and being able to sell the house, but, right. but no, but um, what are some other gigs that you've had to do to sort of make ends meet along the way? Well, I mean, I've done a lot of different things. You know, I used to own a motorcycle shop in LA when I lived in LA. Really? Partners, yeah, I was partners in a custom Harley shop, um, which did not make a lot of money, which is why it's out of business. All right. Um, but like, really, for me, it started out. Um, I mean, I started out, you know, doing sound as a way to make money while I was playing in bands. Okay. You know, like I grew up down here in Orange County. I moved to Hollywood in 1987 to go to MI and started playing in bands and you know, and all that kind of stuff. And then a buddy of mine went to the NAMM show one year and he ended up buying a PA. So we ended up starting a sound company and we did a lot of really cool underground shows. Like this was late eighties, early nineties, you know, where all these really great bands were playing these tiny little shows. Like we used to do this place called Jabberjaw and we did white zombie there. Ooh. And like, and, and he mixed Nirvana there. I wasn't there for the Nirvana show, but you know, he did Nirvana. We did Rage Against the Machine at a oh. juice bar before they got signed. Wow. When it was like, when they, they showed up for, for a sound check, and I was like, oh, that dude from Lockup has a new band. Oh, yeah. Because Tom Morello was in a band called Lockup before right. Rage. You know what I mean? Right. So, like, the, um, the live tracks that are on the uh, first Tool EP, we were doing the live sound for that when, while Shirley Massey was in the truck behind doing, you know, so we did that gig. Like, we did a lot of really cool gigs yeah. like that, you know, wow. back then. You know, and um, and probably got your name out there a little bit too, right? These people are starting to pick- I mean, not really, because it was just kind of our little sound company. You know, we okay. weren't really like, yeah, we did a little bit of networking, but it doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we got to hang out with the guys from Tool and we got to hang out with some cool people here and there, but it's like very peripheral. It wasn't like, oh yeah, you know, we're going to stay in touch and we're going to go have dinner next week or anything like that. It was like, yeah, we're, we, you know, we're doing this gig and it's cool and you guys are cool. Great to meet you. Nice show. And you know, rock on, you know, yeah. like that, that party that we did, the, the tool party where they recorded those tracks was New Year's Eve party. And it was one of the most epic parties that I still have ever been to. I mean, it okay. was nuts. You know, the, the guys from Green Jello and, and Tool had this loft in Hollywood and the party was at the loft. And dude, like we tore that place up. Man. Yeah, this nuts. This is before sobriety for you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This was yeah. like 92, 93. I got sober in 96. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah and, not, um, not that far after though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it was, you know, Oh, and I did, I did uh, security work. Okay. You know? um, I can imagine that being a good rule for you. Yeah. Yeah. I did security and uh, you know, a few other, a few other things. I repoed cars for a while and 
you know, I was a bounty hunter for a little while. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Again, you don't want this problem. Yeah. yeah. That's probably where that kind of comes from. Yeah. You know? I was thinking that the, it's like, it's you, like do the, do the security stuff, you know, like, and, and again, even when I was doing that job, like I tried to be reasonable with, with some people, but there sure. were a few times when it was like, you know, it was, yeah. it was late. It was like early nineties in LA, man. Stuff was going on. Right. Oh yeah. You know, big, big <laughs> like, change. Like there was a lot of, there was a lot of, uh, you know, there was a lot of tension, a lot of things going on. So definitely got in the mix a little bit, but, um, you, you want to kind of maybe elaborate on what brought you to sobriety? Yeah, I was, uh, living downtown, um, right by the seventh street bridge. And, um, basically I came out of a blackout one day and all of our stuff, like we'd been evicted from this warehouse that we were staying in. And, um, like I had no idea what happened, <laughs> Really, you know, just like kind of all the stuff was gone and there was an eviction notice on the door. And I was like, woke up on a cement floor, like what's going on. And, and so my options were pretty much either I was going to get sober or I was looking at kind of life on the street downtown for a little while. And 96, I mean, it's crazy now because you go there now and there's like art galleries and restaurant and valet parking, right. you know? But when I was there, like the stuff that would happen in our alley, you know, and in the neighborhood, like scary time, you know, yeah, it was really violent, really desperate, you know, mm. a lot of like really scary stuff happening, you know, like, so I kind of looked at my options and I've been struggling with this for a while. Like okay. I, 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 you know, I probably started trying to get sober, you know, when I was a teenager Mm -hmm. You know, and I'd been to, you know, a few meetings of this or that, you know, for a while and it never really took, but it finally kind of hit home. Like, okay, I better, you know, try to get my act together or I'm going to be out here on the street. And that doesn't look very appealing. It was, you know? this is you sort of telling yourself this. You didn't have anybody yeah. that said, Hey, Al, get your shit together. There wasn't really anybody to tell me that. Yeah. You know, cause yeah. I mean, by this point, you know, I was pretty isolated. I wasn't really playing music anymore. Okay. You know, I was just kind of like, living and trying to scrape up money doing whatever I could do to, to get by. And, you know, I didn't have a lot of money and, you know, it was, it was like pretty, you know, pretty grim, you yeah. know? And, uh, and it was just kind of a realization, like if I don't get my act together, then, you know, I'm going to be out here on the street and being, a, you know, the 26 year old white dude, long red hair, like the, the LA river scene was not that appealing. Right. You know? Yeah. Cause I knew what was going on and it's not, it's not good. Yeah. You know, um, a lot of people in your circle kind of in that same boat. I didn't have any, I didn't have a circle then. I was just wondering, you know, but if yeah. you were still like mixing and working with, you know, bands, no, you I, hadn't, playing. I hadn't really, I hadn't really, I, I hadn't really been doing any audio. I really hadn't, I really hadn't been doing much of anything, you know, I'd okay. like kind of worked some construction odd jobs and stuff like that. Like it just kind of a point, See, what happened with me in music was I played in a lot of bands. Like I got out of music school in 88 and I played in a lot of bands, showcased. I got in a couple bands that got some record deals and whatever, but everything kind of fell through. And it kind of just like got to a point where I was working so hard because I'd be working day jobs and then go playing, you know, going to rehearsal and playing bands at night, like yeah. really going after it. And I just kind of got burned out, you know? Right. So I was just like kind of, you know, dissolved into this massive just like kind of drinking and you know trying not to drink but then getting drunk anyway and you know just kind of struggling with that and trying to scrape together whatever I could do to pay you know a few hundred dollars rent to stay in this little warehouse downtown and you know just like my life had really kind of just gone downhill you know yeah. and it just got to a point where it was like okay I'm either gonna get my act together or you know I'm gonna go take my chances out there you know and yeah and I, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to try to get my act together. Yeah. You know, so, so I, I got a resume together and I started looking for jobs and there was actually a friend of mine who was working in uh, post-production for television as a tape operator. And I was like, that job looks kind of cool. You know, yeah. he's got like a, a, like a real job. He's making good money. You know, I go, maybe I'll see if I can get in, you know, to some post place as a tape op or do something like that. And so I made up resumes and I created a schedule for myself. Like I got super disciplined, you yeah. know, and I would pass out resumes and, um, and 
phone and do follow up phone calls the week after and all this stuff, you know, and so I was just out there hustling and I wasn't like sending them out. I was like knocking on people's doors like here, I'm, I'm here to work. I'm ready yeah. to go. Yeah. You know, I've, I've done all this audio for these cool bands and, you know, I've been a sound guy and this and that and the other, you know, let me in. Give me this a is shot. You, this is your you commitment know? to chapter two in Al's life, right? Where you're saying, yeah, right. right no, I mean, really, like it, right. I, hit, I hit that bottom. I don't even see it as an option to go back, right? So I'm out there face to face. I can tell yeah. people with certainty. I'm I your gotta, guy. I got to get a job. I got to pull my act together. At this point, I'm basically squatting in this same warehouse because I don't have anywhere else to go. We've already been evicted. Like the sheriffs have already come through to kick us out, you know, and, I, and, I, and I'd had like face offs with the management company. You know, like you got, you got to get out of here. I'm like, well, I'm not leaving. So what do you want to do? You know, like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm going to get out when I can get out. You Were know? you doing any kind of recovery program or anything at that point? Or? Not, not yet. Okay. Not really. You know what I mean? I was just like, like, I, was so on, I got to get a job. I got to get some money. I got to get out of here. Like I got to get some money to get some rent so I can live somewhere, yeah. you know? And eventually I got hired at this place called Post Logic Studios, which was awesome. Um, it's not there anymore, sadly, but it was like the, the crew there was, was killer. You yeah. know, it was like, I learned so much from those guys, you know, like professionally, personally, like it was really great place for me to work at the time, but I got hired as a runner. Did you know anybody there? No. Okay. This is just you no. cold calling it. All right. This is just me like going in, here's my resume. Here I am. I want to work, you know, yeah. do, let me do whatever I can to do it. I was, I was hyper motivated. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think that's kind of what got me the gig. 26? You're 26 yeah. years old? Oh, yeah. yeah I, was, I was 26 years old. All right. And um, I was just hyper motivated to get in there and do it. And they're like, okay, well, we'll offer you the morning runner position. You have to come in at 530 in the morning, make sure all the bays are clean, set up all the coffees, set up all the bagel plates, you know, do all, you know, like prep the whole facility for people to start coming in at like eight o'clock in the morning. I was like, I'll be here at, at five. Yeah. You know? Yep got up every morning and I just started hustling, you know? Yeah. And then I had some friends who were, who were in recovery and, and, uh, and so, I, you know, I went to some meetings with them and I just like, it finally just hit home. You know what I mean? Like, wow. Okay. These guys, there was this one guy in particular that I knew when he was out there and he'd been like sober for like four years. And I was like, Whoa, this guy's life has totally changed around. Right. You know? And I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I'm doing all the stuff they tell everybody to do. Yeah. I was like, well, maybe if I do that, that'll work. Right. You know? Yeah. So I got kind of tied in with a group of people and, you know, just got involved with that. So it was like, get up early in the morning, go to work, come home, you know, get a little bite to eat, go hang out with those guys for a while, come home, get some sleep, get up, go to work. And that was just like my routine. Yeah. So you, you know? almost had like a ritual. Daily ritual. Yeah. Like every day. Yeah. You know, and I was seeing the same people and doing, you know, doing, and I just kind of got involved in, in that. And, and, you know, before I knew it, like I was two years in and by this time, like I'd been transferred to a day runner and then one of the audio assistants left. And uh, so I had an opportunity to move into the audio assistant chair. And so like my first real a two gig was on uh, mad TV, like season, oh. I think season two or three, I started nice. a two for the post-production mix of mad TV and some other stuff, you know? Okay. And through that, I met, um, you know, a lot of other clients and, and things like that. And, you know, and I would, I would stay at night sometimes and do spec commercials for these up and coming directors, like the sales department there. Uh, they were really into commercials. Like we did a lot of commercial work and stuff like that. So they knew a lot of commercial directors. And so, you know, when they wanted to do a reel, they needed audio mix, but they didn't really want to pay for it. I said, Hey, you know what? I'll stay late. I'll stay after my shift and I'll mix their commercials for them. So I'd like work crazy hours. Cause I do my regular day's work and then take a little break and then hop into whatever studio was empty and mix commercials until like midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And then wow. come back at studio at eight o'clock the next day, work my regular shift. And I didn't do that every night, but like maybe sure. a couple nights a week, you know, yeah. Get my chops up, get my mixing chops up, figure out how all this stuff works. And then like if I got stuck one night and I couldn't figure something out that I'd come in the next day and go, Hey, I was trying to do this at this mix last night. What do you do about this? You know, and the yeah. engineers there were awesome. You know? Yeah. It, 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 so, almost I mean, it's sort of a paid apprenticeship at that second phase of the the day, right? Where you can kind of get yeah. some education. And that's great, man. Yeah. Yeah. God, so you stay in touch with any of those guys? Yeah. Yeah. We still stay in touch on Facebook and 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 chat every once in a while, you know? Yeah. And uh yeah. And they were, and they, I mean, they were great guys, you know, super, I'm super, super grateful for all those guys, you know, they taught me a lot and, and, 
you know, specifically my first A2 gig, I was the assistant for this guy named Fred Howard, who I think is working at Larson now. But um, well, I don't think anybody's working anywhere, but theoretically. Right. Yeah. Anyway, and, and one thing about Fred on a personal level is he was kind of a religious guy and he had a wife and he had three kids, you know, and he was a tremendous father. Oh, yeah. You know, like he was always there. If his kids had something, he would put on the schedule, like, I'm not available this afternoon because my kid has something that I have to go to, you know, and I'm leaving at two o'clock to go to my kid's game or whatever. Nice. You know, and they would, and his clients and everybody would work around that. I'm like, whoa, you can, you can do that. Like, yeah. You can work sometimes for your kids. Right. You know, it's like my parents split up when I was, when I was like two and I didn't even speak to my father after I was 19. Like really we didn't have any contact. Yeah. At all. Wow. And and so to see this guy, you know, like he was a really huge example for me, which I didn't really appreciate at the time, but now being a father, you bet, you know, he set a huge example for me in that, in that regard. Yeah. You know, yeah. like he was the example of like what a dad is supposed to be like to me. That's you know what I mean. So I was working with the guy and he was that, and you know, he definitely deserves a big shout out and a lot of credit for that because you know, there's things that I saw him do with his family that I apply to my relationship with my son right now. Yeah, that's you so know? good, man. And it's and it's important to have those kinds of influences and to take advantage of them. You yeah. know, I'd say probably one of my biggest lessons in life is to learn from other people's mistakes and to also learn from other people's good habits. Sure. Yeah. You know? it, you I know, have to figure out everything myself. Yeah. You know? If somebody's already paved the way and it's working, then you might want to pay attention to what they're doing. In all aspects. You right? know what I mean? Absolutely, man. So yeah. Now I, uh, I think it's great because I do see the connection you have with Aiden and for, you know, it's funny because people in the music business, I think it, it's sort of expected that they're disconnected from their kids and the family life. If you're a multi-millionaire rich uh, singer songwriter and you're out of the road, you can afford to bring your family with you on tour, you know, and you can have nannies during the daytime and you can have time dedicated to spending time with them. But I chose not to tour for the, 15 or so years as my kids were growing up in the early years where I didn't want to be out other than one offs on, you know, every few weeks or every month or two, because I wanted to be the guy that was with my kids all the time, you know, and now I'm sure they're so sick of me, but when we've been <laughs> quarantined, I, I mean, I'm taking yeah. advantage of it. You know, I, I split in a few windows I had a window of a few hours yesterday that my youngest son, Nolan and I ran up to the mountain and hung out. The yeah, snow. I know. I saw that you picture, know. man. That was awesome. It was cool. Except I raced back. I literally got on air with the episode yesterday as the show was starting. And I knew I'm, eh, I'm kind of pushing it a little bit, but I want to have a life with my kids. They're stir crazy, you know? And yeah. you've been like that with Aiden all the time. And when there's, when you're present, you know, you come back and you've passed on tours and passed on, on financially lucrative things for you because you know that it's really important for you to be there with your kid. And the fact that you didn't have a father figure around at that point, obviously it was probably a real big reason for that, but you kind of broke the cycle, you know, cause a lot of times people perpetuate that, you know, yeah. and, and they, yeah. they didn't have a father figure or a parent, you know, a parent there that was present yeah. or, or you know, attentive and they just continue that cycle, right? They just parent. It's a hundred percent. It's a hundred percent due to sobriety though. You know, like my dad was, was a big drinker and you know, and that's why I wasn't around. He was off partying and doing his thing. And, right. and, and, to that point, I want to say that, you know, I don't, I'm like, I'm not angry at him or I'm not resentful at him or anything. Some people just aren't cut out to be parents. Right. It's just not their thing. Yeah. You know, and you that's know, okay. You mentioned resentment and that's one thing that's, you know, it's major in recovery. It's a big, you know, sort of character defect that almost everybody has, you know, it's the biggest thing that I struggle with all the time and resentment, letting go of stuff that kind of, you know, I felt wronged or, you know, somehow I just felt slighted and there's something magical at least about being able to let go of some resentment that frees you up. Right. So you, you mentioned not having resentment towards your dad right now. And, and a big part of that was recovery. Do you remember a point in your recovery phase where you felt like, yeah, you know what? I can, I can sort of dispose of the baggage. You know? oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, there he is. Uh, uh, yeah. My dog's here. Uh, do you remember that point in your life where you were able to uh, dispose of like, the, the resentment, the baggage that you had from all those people that have, you know, like there was a point I'm sure where you felt resentful towards your dad, right? Oh where, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that, for sure. That, that split my for life. Sure. My, and uh, so was there a point where maybe did you work with a sponsor or did you? Oh yeah. 
yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And well, specifically the, the thing with my dad was, you know, I, I, I did a lot of inventory on that. Like I went to Al Anon over that relationship. Like I did a lot of, and just for me, like nothing to do with him, but just, you know, I did a lot of stuff around that relationship. And what I came to realize, like the end of it was exactly what I just said. Like I just come to accept that some people just aren't cut out to be parents. Yeah. It's just not their thing. Like right. they might have kids, but being a parent just isn't in their wheelhouse, sure. you know? Yeah. And that was my dad. It just wasn't his thing. Yeah. You know? And yeah, you know, I suffered from it in some ways, but you know, in some ways, it, you know, it's kind of better off. Cause you know, would I have rather been around a guy who didn't want me around all the time and was just mean? Cause that was kind of my, my experience with him. The times that I did see him, you know, he was just kind of drunk and angry all the time. Sure. No. Did, yeah. Would I want to grow up around that every single day? Would I want to live with that every single day? No. I mean, in, in, in a lot of ways, you know, it kind of did me a favor by not, you know, by, not by, not. by, by, by losing that relationship. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the last time I saw him, we were having dinner. I, I was 19 and, um, you know, he'd called me and we had a conversation. It was like, well, you know, you're out of your mom's house now. You're your own man. You're independent. You know, we should try to reconnect, whatever. And we're sitting there having dinner and I'd, been in this and I was one of the times I was trying to get sober and I've been sober for about a month you know and I told him like you know I haven't been drinking for like a month and my 19th birthday dude I told like I went off yeah. like I was sick for days like yeah. I, I was like yeah I'm 19 and I went out to this bar in Hollywood that I could drink at and just like I went on like a two-day bender and and when I came out of that I was just like you know what I gotta stop I gotta stop this nonsense this is insane mm -hmm. so I hadn't had a drink in like a month or so and, uh, and, you know, and he's sitting there getting drunk. He didn't even order dinner. He just ordered a carafe of wine and he's just sitting there getting drunk. He's like, yeah, well, you know, you must be a pussy because, you know, you can't handle your alcohol and blah, 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 blah. And meanwhile, he's just getting pissed drunk, you know? Yeah. And he finally just passed out at the table. Oh, you know? And wow. I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm just thinking about this, like, is this really the kind of thing that I need in my life? Right. You know, here I am trying to get sober and my passed out father is telling me that, you know, Pussies can't handle their alcohol. Right. Like, I'm done. Yeah. So I just bounced. That was it. I got up. I called a friend for a ride home. And I got a ride home. And I didn't speak to him since. Never. Really? Nope. Since nope. 19? Yeah. Good yep. for you, man. I mean. And then, and well, he passed away a couple summers ago. I was, I was on tour with a band. And, um, and you know how I was talking about, like, there's certain cities that just have a certain thing? Yeah. I always have trouble in Boston. For really? whatever reason, whenever I go to Boston, there's some kind of problem. Okay. I could go down a list, but like this last time I was on tour in Boston and I got this call that my dad had passed away and I had to sign these papers to have him, uh, to have him, a uh, uh, un, uh, unattended burial at sea, I guess they call it. Like they were going to cremate him and then, you know, Neptune society, or whoever was going to go throw his ashes in the ocean. But the point is like, that's the point that my father's life had gotten to. There wasn't even anybody to show up at his funeral. Right. Wow. You know what that's, I mean? That is tragic. Man. Like you're legally, you're the next of kin. So we need you to sign off that we can go throw his ashes in the ocean. Okay, yeah. cool. You know, have me fax over the, have fax over the paper. So I had the, I had the, uh, you know, esteemable task of going to the production manager, of the venue saying, Hey, I'm getting these papers delivered. Can you print them out for me? And then can we, you know, scan uh. them and send them back? You know, when I asked one of the guys in the, in the band to sign for me, I needed someone to sign as a witness, Okay, yeah. you know, so, cause I signed the thing and like, what happened? I'm like, well, my dad died and he has to be cremated now. So, and I have to sign off on it. And they're like, well, and I'm like, no, no, it's cool. It's, yeah. it's not that heavy. Right. You know, we don't have to make this like a heavy thing. It's just, I have to just send the paperwork back and be done with it. And the next day, I think we had a day off in New York. And I remember just like, you know, we we were in like Williamsburg. We were playing at a Rough Trade in, uh, okay. in New York, and um, so we're like in Williamsburg. And I just found this little restaurant. I just kind of like had some dinner. And I just sort of like contemplated the relationship with my dad and the fact that he was gone and that, you know, all that. Like, just it's it's over now. Purge it. You, bet. you know, there's never it's never gonna come back. And like, oh, you know, like there's not gonna be anything. Like it's done. Yeah. You know. And, and it was cool. You know, I just kind of like took a couple of hours, you know, had the dessert. <laughs> I was going to sit there and just like, yeah. you know, chilled out and, and, and did my thing. And that was that, you know, and it's, yeah. and it's fine. Well, what it is, I mean, really people talk about closure, you know, in the end of any relationship. And I mean, that really does wrap it up in a bow may not be pretty. Right. But, uh, yep. yeah, 
the stuff that gets unresolved is the most challenging for a lot of people, right? Because I would think it's easier to hang out a resentment without having any kind of closure, but you really did have a little bit. You know, dad painted a pretty good picture for you at 19 at dinner. And it's amazing to think it the things that happened to you at 19, how formative they are, to, you know, for you now as a father, yeah. you know, with Aiden. Yeah. But, probably not a day that goes by that you don't think about that experience you had at the dinner table. Maybe not every day, but I bet, you know, it comes Actually, up. Actually, to be honest, I don't think about it hardly ever. Okay. It's, it's just gone. You know, yeah. it's like, there's so many things that have happened that, and, and that's the brilliant thing about sort of, you know, doing work about things that have happened in your past and letting it go. Sure. You bet. You know, just let it, and, and like one of the big principles that I learned about a few years ago, um, is of detachment. You know, there's this sort of philosophy principle, you know, a lot of like Buddhism and Eastern religions and stuff. And I don't protest to be a Buddhist or anything like that, but studying this one principle of detachment, which is just like, okay, this is something that causes me suffering. So I'm going to let it go. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if this, if this thing causes me suffering, I'm not going to hang on to it. I'm going to let it go. And along with it, then I don't have to suffer anymore. Healthy. And and that goes along with being the eye of the storm, like just kind of being at peace. You know, like my ultimate goal in my life right now is just to be at peace. Yeah. I don't want a lot of drama. I don't want a lot of trouble. Yeah. You know, I just want to have a good life. You know, I want to treat people good, you know, but at the same time, you know, don't take any crap. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you know, it's funny, man, like the detachment thing, there is a human, I think a part of human nature that likes to hang on to that stuff. You know, it, I don't know what it is. It's ego. But, but, it's ego and it's pride. Yeah. Okay. You don't yeah. want to admit that you, you, you don't want to admit that this thing is causing you pain. You don't want to admit that you're fallible. You don't want to admit that you're vulnerable. Sure. Right. Your ego says, no, 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 you can handle it. You're tough. You know, right. blah, 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 you know, stay in there. And, and when you sort of let go of that, then it's like, no, you know what? I don't have to be, I don't have to prove that I'm a tough guy. I don't have to prove that I can fight this. I don't have to prove that I can be, I can just let it go. Yeah. Oh man, that's so healthy, you know, really. And it's not, I'm not perfect. You know what I mean? Oh, like, no, but it's but, not like, I, I'm not trying to sit up here like, oh, I'm Mr. Guru, peaceful guy. Cause I'm not, Yeah. you know, like I, I definitely have my moments, but that's, that's sort of my goal. That's sort of what I work towards, you know, to just kind of have a cool life, be able to get along with everybody, let everything run smooth. Yeah. You know, don't start that's, none, won't be none. You know yeah, what I mean? Right. Now that's, I mean, it really is a healthy way to look at it. Even right now, everything that's kind of going on with uh, the pandemic, there are a million things out of your control, right? If you think about, you know, yeah. the sort of slogans of, of, you know, recovery about looking at what you've got control over, right? And being able to let go of the stuff that you don't have any control over. The, you know, you didn't have any control over your dad, right? Or uh, it, with his, you know, sobriety or parenting or anything right. like that right. you are able to make a difference and a change in the way that you're going to parent right so it's good right. you, you, if you don't necessarily look back at with resentment on those things but you can say all right that was a mistake that i saw that i could as a parent that's one thing i don't want to do as a dad and uh and you know really fortunate for aiden to be in that situation where you know he gets to learn from the mistakes that your dad made right right that's right. cool what well, that and a, and a whole lot of other things too you yeah. know and one thing that I try to do with Aiden is, is listen to what's important to him, mm. you know, cause there's certain things that I want to do that he's not into. And if he's not into it, I don't want to make him do it. You know, like I'm looking at the comments here and I see that my wife, Michelle is on here. Hey baby. And we're taking a road trip next week. Okay. You know, we, we have plans to take a road trip and Aiden is kind of like, you know, he doesn't really want to go, you know, he just wants to stay home and play video games online with his friends and ride his bike around or whatever. Yeah. So he might not go with this, you know, sure. and I, and I had a conversation with him like, Hey, you know what? I might be taking this road trip with Michelle and Lucy next week. And, and, you know, we're going to go around, you know, you want to come with us. You want to stay, you know, we're going to go, you know, hit up some lakes or whatever we're going to do. And, you know, and if he's not into it, then I'm not going to force him to do it. You know? Okay. You want to stay home with grandma? Then you can stay home with grandma. Allowing him to make you know? his own choices. And yeah. 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 You know, and, and I think that's really important for kids to grow up knowing that they have their own voice, knowing that they get to have a choice, knowing that they get to have their own opinions. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Like, I might not agree with you. You yeah. know, you might say, oh, I want, you know, ice cream and cookies at midnight. And I might not say, and I might say no, but it's well, good that you voiced your opinion that you want right. ice cream and cookies, but no, you got to brush your teeth and go to bed. Because dad's going to have those ice cream and cookies when you go to bed. So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that great philosophies, buddy. I you know, know what I mean? There's so, a 
I, you know, I, you say that you're not a, a guru, but it's a lot of sage wisdom in there, my man. I think uh, I, uh, I, I, one of the things I miss the most about being out on the road is just uh, being able to, you know, really have authentic conversations. You and I just hanging out after yeah. the show, drinking our chocolate milk and talking about real life stuff. And so we don't have to make this a Zoom conversation every time, you know, but I really do miss this with you, you know? Oh, yeah, totally. It's a beautiful thing. Totally. Well, yeah. it's funny because, you know, Josh, and I got to give shout outs to Josh for doing Sun and Moon the other day. You know, oh he my put God. up on his thing. If you guys haven't seen it, if you don't know Josh Thompson, go to his Facebook and watch him play Sun and Moon. It's an above and beyond song. And a lot of times when we're like driving, you know, I'm driving the van usually after the gig and the guys will kind of pass out, go to sleep, whatever. And I'll put on some above and beyond to kind of keep myself awake. If you, if you ever have to drive late, you know, some trance music, some good old... Yeah. It'll just keep you going, man. Right. Like the, the odometer just kicks by right along with that kick drum. Right. You know, and, uh, and, and Sun and Moon, of course, is one of their huge, massive hits. And Josh did a, like an incredible rendition of it the other day. And I put a comment on his page. I'm like, dude, I'm going to come pick you up in the minivan. We're going to throw the drums in the back. We're going to drive out to the parking lot of the Mandalay Bay. I'm going to set up the drum kit. You're going to play three songs and then we're going to load it up and we're going to come back. Oh, please live stream that for me, will you? Like, God. Just yeah. like a lost 80s tour. You know, we're going to go to Vegas. Three songs. And come home. <laughs> right. In the sun. Yeah. With, uh, make sure that all the rest of the chaos that goes along with that gig goes along with that, you know, your, yeah. your jam. Yeah. But the, uh, I, I shared that version on my wall, my Facebook wall too. So okay, cool. Scroll back cool. down through the feed and check it out, man. Cool. He, uh, Josh is a beautiful human being. His voice is freaking ridiculous, and the way that he, the the, the way he played that song, yeah, man. I didn't I, see that coming at all. I was yeah, like, when I right. saw the, you know, I, I got a little notification because I took uh, another thing. I took the Facebook app off my phone. Like I don't, Smart. I don't have Facebook on my phone anymore. A couple of weeks ago, because this whole like mask, no mask debate thing. It was just like out of control. Like, and my opinion on it is people are going to do what they're going to do. Yeah. You yeah. can set up whatever rules you want, you know, and, but some people are going to wear the mask and they're going to, you know, be responsible. And other people are going to go, no, I'm not doing it. No, no, whatever. Like right. do your thing. You know, for me, I'm staying at home for me. If I go out, I'm wearing a mask, yeah. not just for me, but you know, it's, right. it's not really comfortable for me. I don't really, I'd rather not to be honest, yeah. but I do it because there are other people around me you know, like yeah. my mom, my son, Michelle, Lucy, yeah. you know, people that I come in contact with that want me to wear the mask for their consideration. So, right. you know what, I'm going to wear the mask. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you you're know? not, you're not threatening to kick somebody's ass because they're not wearing a mask out. Right. Right. Well, like there was this thing, I went to go pick up some food a few days ago and, you know, and I was wearing my mask and I'm in line and there were some guys behind me, like talking smack, like, Oh, you know, pussy's wearing mask and blah, 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 blah. And I thought to myself, and it was clear that they were like talking about me, you yeah. know, but like kind of so I could hear it. And I thought about like, do I turn around and confront these guys and have a situation or, or not? And it was one of those things where, you know what? Again, my objective is to get food and leave. Right. So I'm going to get food and I'm going to leave. Yeah, man. And those guys can say whatever they want. They can do whatever they want. It really doesn't affect me. I mean, yeah, it was annoying and it was kind yeah. of pissing me off a little bit. Sure. But it was like, do I want to escalate this thing? Or is it one of those things that I can just chalk mm. off, get too my bad. food and be on my way? So I just got my food and went on my way. You did not want that problem. Yeah. I, you know, it's yeah. one of those things I just don't like. I didn't have to deal with it. So I'm not gonna. Yeah. You know? But like those other situations, sometimes you have to deal with it. Sure. You know? And but, but if your main objective too is to maintain peace, you know, just avoid the chaos, then yeah, yeah you know, because they have no impact on you whatsoever. Like, you know, you're not a pussy, you know, you and, and like your comfort level with yourself is just fine, you know? So anybody yeah. else's opinion really doesn't matter. It's yeah. something great for your kids to see that too, right? You yeah. Know, if, if our kids can see that, you know, we're comfortable with who we are. We know who we are. We know what we stand for and we're digni dignified and, you know. But. Dude, along those lines, I got to tell you a story about Aiden when he was in preschool. All right. So I told him a long time ago, I'm like, if anybody gives you a hard time, you know, like when you go into preschool now, you're going to be around other kids, whatever. If they give you a hard time, you send up for yourself and you say, no, you leave me alone. If they do something you don't like, you tell them. So you don't necessarily have to go tell the teacher or whatever. You just right. stand up for yourself and you tell them, right? Well, there was an issue literally in the sandbox with him and these other kids that were like fighting over some kind of toy or something. And, and he was upset when I pick him up. Well, I go, what happened? You know? And he didn't want to tell me. And finally he said, oh, well, you know, these two kids, I was playing with this toy. They wanted to take this toy and da, 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 da. I'm like, so what happened? I, he's like, I 
grabbed the toy and I said, no, I was playing with this. You leave me alone. And I go, what happened? He goes, they left me alone. I go, did you tell the teacher? He goes, no. And I went, that's my boy. Yeah, you win. You know, yeah. that's, you know, that's what's up. Yeah, man. That's, that you is know? what's up. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's hope that he's just maintains that all the way through. So that- I mean, he, he has, you know, and it's funny because like we just, it's obviously the end of the uh, school year and his class every year hands out awards, you know, and every year he gets like the past two years, he's got like something about being the joker, the comedian, the funny guy, you know, Yeah. because he's always kind of cracking jokes and he always makes everybody feel good. And he always like really includes everybody. Yeah. You know? Cool. And that's something that I've really been trying to impress upon him too, is to being inclusive of all the kids. Like even if, especially if you see some kid who's like, doesn't necessarily have a lot of friends or who's being, or like the new kid in school. Yeah. You know, I kind of tell him like, whenever you see the new kid in school, always go up and introduce yourself, you know, shake their hands. And, you know, I've taught him how to introduce himself to people, right on. you know, walk up and say, hi, my name's Aiden. Nice to meet you. Yeah. You know? And, and, and he's been really good about it. You know, like we'll be out somewhere and he'll be kind of shy. And I'm like, Aiden, go introduce yourself. You know, oh, I don't know. Go, and he'll and he'll and he'll go do it. You know, good man. Yeah. And um. And so his teachers have made comments about how he's always really inclusive, and you know, he's always like treats everybody with with respect, and he's kind, and he's funny to everybody, and he's helpful, and you know, sometimes he talks a little bit too much in class or he gets distracted or whatever. But you know, he's nine. What do you? Yeah, do? that's that's the age. <laughs> you know what man. I mean? what, but right. I mean, overall, like he's doing, you know, he's doing really well. You know? so and, and, uh, you know, so I'm, that's, that's like the thing that I'm probably most grateful for, you know, in yeah. life is that, is that he's doing well, you know, cause we, you know, when I split up from his mom, we definitely had a rough patch of a, of a couple of years. Sure. You know, we went through a lot of drama, like to the courts and all that kind of stuff. And, and now things are pretty smooth, you know, I've, he's with me and, you know, and everything's cool and, you know, we're, we're getting by all right. So. There'll be storms later on, you know, as long as oh, yeah. you keep, you keep oh, showing yeah. them, you can be the eye of the hurricane, <laughs> but you know, you know, the thing is like, I don't fear that. Cause I've been through storms. Yeah, that's right. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. I've been through storms. Like, yeah. you know, somebody was, I forget what the context was, but somebody was saying, Oh, well, what if this happens? Well, I'm like, man, I, I don't been through it. Like I'm really, there's not anything that I really fear. Cause I've already been through that stuff. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So good yeah, man. it's not like i'm like yeah bring it on let's see because you know right. I've, I've had enough but right. at the same time if things happen i'm like okay yeah no that. makes me confident that you know? whenever when we get back on the road again you know i just bring my uh my hurricane tamer over that's, then, it. <laughs> that's I, it oh man i you i know? love it i really i i uh i feel like got a really good sense of perspective you know, catching back up here. Did you have more comments from people chatting in here? Oh, yeah. Uh, Listen to that. Uh, yeah, I see Josh just saying a lot of wisdom between these two two fathers. You know what, man? Um, it's just really great, I think, to talk to another guy who's in the business and also understands what it means to be a present dad. You know, I know how much you love your kiddo. And it's, uh, it's pretty amazing, right, to be just a father at this point right now a lot of lessons to be learned right yeah a lot a lot of things that we can pick up right now in the face of adversity you know so i i'm grateful for it to be honest with you well you know the other thing too is is i kind of keep a lot of perspective about that whole face of adversity thing you know like i think about my grandfather's generation and when they were fighting world war ii right Right. and i've heard a lot of stories from him like him and all my great uncles like they were, they were in war. Like there was a time that our country all banded together. Like we were seriously at war. It's not like now where we can all kind of sit at home and we go, okay, our special forces are going over to Afghanistan or whatever. And they're right. fighting. Like we're very detached from it. Yep. Back then people at home were not detached from it. You know, right. like my grandmother was working at, you know, a secret aircraft manufacturing thing in Burbank that was supposed to be Disney studios, but really I think it was like Lockheed or wow. one of the aircraft companies where they were building stuff. There was rationing everything to, you know, to save for the war, you know, corn syrup came out of that because they were rationing sugar. So they invented corn syrup to sweeten things with. Yeah. Like a lot of things that we have now are, that are a result of them having to be inventive right. and improvise things that happened during the war. You know, right. we're not always aware of that, but when you think about it, you're like, wow, I wonder yeah. what it was like in the 1940s when they didn't have the technology that we had. Like those guys really had to go like fight, fight. Right. You yeah. know, and the people at home were really impacted. Yeah. You know, 
like significantly with the rationing and, you know, having to black out your windows at night and like all the stuff that even the people at home had to go through while our, while everybody was overseas, like really, you know, really at it. Yeah. You know, and, um, and they had a hard time, you know, think about the people who grew up in the, in the depression. Right. Yeah. They had a hard time, you know, I don't get to get my hair cut for a couple months. Right. You know? yeah. And I don't get to go on tour for a couple months. I have to stay home on my internet and talk to my buddies through social right. media. Yeah. You know, that's not, you know what I mean? It's like, it, it, yeah, it's, things it's, are inconvenient, but we're not really suffering. It's not to discredit you know? people that are, you know, like medically impacted, you know, and people that really have lost like all their savings and they're, they're struggling you know, there, there still is a real challenge for a lot of people, but you're right. Well, I don't mean to, I don't mean to diminish that. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying that like, from my expect, from my experience, yeah. like what I'm going through right now, right. It really isn't that bad. I'm you know? with you. Yeah, and, and, and like my friend's wife uh, is a, is an ER nurse at County USC medical center, you know, and I've talked to her a few times about stuff and like they're, they're having a tough time. Yeah, like, that's hard. She's like sleeping in a tent in the backyard because she doesn't want to get the kids infected. So she has to wave at her kids through the window and like they're having a hard time. The people I know a few people who've had it and who've yeah. had a hard time through it, you know, you and I know people who've known people who've died yeah. through it and they're having a hard time with it. You know what I mean? Like those people are really suffering and my heart definitely goes out to them, you know, and if I wish I had like some kind of magic wand where I could take away all the suffering, but I don't. Yeah. You know, but I'm just saying that my experience of this isn't, you know, it's bad because I'm not making any money and I'm not working and I am going a little bit stir crazy. But in the big picture things, I have a pretty easy. Yeah. You know, hey, a lot of it's perspective. It really is, oh. man. And so I'm, you know, and it's nice to have a distraction. I mean, for me, this is great to catch back up with you and some of my other buddies, you know, in a way that we can, we can talk about some of this and commiserate and still, you know, appreciate the fact that we're really blessed to have our community, you know, so I, uh, I, I'm grateful to get the time with you, man. Gotta yeah. Be, yeah. And I, I'm glad that you're going to get away with Michelle for a little bit this next week. So. Yeah, it's going to be cool. I went up to see them in Big Bear. Like we haven't seen each other really since the beginning of all this stuff happened. I went up to Big Bear uh, last week for a few days and hung out with them. And it was so cool, man. Just like wow. chilling out in the mountains and but both of us, you know, we're all getting a little bit stir crazy and we're re kind of ready for a little road trip. So we're yeah, gonna, you know, we're going to take a little road trip and just chill out for a while and Nice. You know, and it's nice to be in that place. I mean, a lot of people know that the, like our relationship has had a, definitely had its ups and downs and, and things like that. But, you know, it's, it is what it is. You know, she's doing her thing up in Big Bear. I'm down here. And, you know, we had big plans to try to make some changes this year. But obviously, you know, a lot of things have been impacted. So right. we're just taking it a day at a time and doing the best we can with what we got to work with. As we have to, man. And that's okay. Yeah. You know, it's okay if everything doesn't go your way. It's okay if everything doesn't work out. It's okay if there's some conflicts and you can resolve them and, you know, and you get through everything. And, you know, that's sensei. This is just part of the, this is part of the thing. That is, man. Yes. Part of the you, thing. You, you wear know. many hats and that's a good <laughs> one. Now that, that, that's why you'll be like handpicked to get back out there when it's time again. Cause you, you know, being able to be the, uh, the, the sane one in the storm is pretty good. So. I am. Um, I, I really, I'm grateful for our hang, but, and a friendship. Yeah, so am I. God, so I miss I. you. I miss but, you uh, too. Let me, uh, let me know how your vacation goes. And I will. Uh, we'll watch for more. Uh, Josh uh, oh, and I have to, before we go, I definitely have to give a shout out to Nick Feldman because he reached out to me today and, you know, so, so I got to give big shout outs to Nick Feldman. You know, he was the, uh, Wang Chung was the uh, catalyst for me getting into this whole eighties thing. You know, I got a phone call many years ago about, doing a like a two-week tour with Wang Chung and I was like wait a minute the Wang Chung from the 80s right like, those guys yeah and I thought about it and I was like this is either going to be fantastic or it's going to be horrifying either way I'm going to come back with a fantastic a great story yeah you know I mean? and as soon as I met Jack and Nick like they're the, just the loveliest guys ever you know it's and true. Josh and Tia was in the band at that time so it was like like we all just kind of met up with each other at this Motel 6 in New Jersey and did rehearsal uh -huh. for two days and then kicked off this East Coast tour you know, and then ever since then, it's just been, you know, one thing after another, you know, and we've, you know, we've had ups and downs and crazy adventures and good times, but, you know, I love those guys. I do you know? too, man. And, You're and from that has grown my relationships with all these other artists. Right. You know, right. The, like the whole list of them, but yeah. it all kind of started with there in this whole genre. And then we do shows with these different bands and, you know, and that's like, it was, it's all just been like networking 
Yeah. You know, well, just meeting people on different shows and like, oh, hey, you know, our guy's not available. Can you come out with us? And, oh, hey, I got this thing going. Can you do this? And, you know. And everybody, everybody wants to work with Al. You know, wow. Well. You know, I mean, if, if you didn't know your stuff and you weren't easy and great to work with, then it wouldn't happen, you know, but there's yeah. a reason people pick you, yeah. you know, so I, yeah. I'm, I'm grateful. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, yeah. Jack. Yeah, yeah. I, I love them too, man. Those, those guys, people are probably sick of me just raving about my Wang Chung family, but I do love them. Oh, and the thing is, we could gush about everybody in that whole scene. I know it. There's, I there's know. There's so many bands, like, I don't even want to start like trying to tick everybody off because I don't want to name everybody off because I don't want to leave anybody out. Yeah. I, we, know? We're, we're really but, fortunate. They, they're yeah. all family. You know, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cool community. And I know that a lot of the people that are watching have all been part of that community as well, you know, yeah. at shows and appreciating. So we miss you guys all too. Most definitely. Right on, man. Most well, definitely. I, I know that you've got your uh, SPD 20 behind you. I've got yep. my, 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 uh, SPDSX. There, there you go. So we'll get we'll get back to our electronic. It's not plugged in, but you know, I mean, it's not turned on right now, but you know. So yeah, I, yeah no, we'll we'll do our yeah. chopping and uh, let's get yeah. ready so that we can get back out there again. What do you yeah, say? Dude, we should we should do a Zoom call with just the two of us and do some uh, do some drum jam. <laughs> yeah, if there wasn't such latency, I'll blame everything on Zoom for my chops <laughs> being so bad. Exactly. God, man. Well, man, I, it's, it's cool to catch up, my friend. I love you. and uh, love you too, man. And thanks for having me on to do this, man. It was really cool. You I'm, know? Really, I'm glad to see you again. It's really cool to catch up with you. You too. Let's, uh, yeah. let's go hang out at the Star Wars camp at uh, Disney next time I'm down, all right? Most definitely. All right, We'll, we'll go fly the Millennium Falcon together. That sounds awesome. And it, you know, as, as, as rides go at theme parks, that yeah. one is actually pretty cool. Right on. Yeah. You know? So, so yeah, you should check it out. All right, my friend. Well, listen, buddy. Thank you for the wise wisdom again. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. It was really cool. It's I'm gonna good go hang. I'm gonna detach. Be able to right, let dude. go a little bit today. <laughs> All right, pal. I'll talk to you later. All right, man. See okay. You.